You will find it more helpful to your prayers if you have some objects at which you aim, and I think also if you have some persons whom you will mention. Do not merely plead with God for sinners in general, but always mention some in particular. If you are a Sunday school teacher, don't simply ask that your class may be blessed, but pray for your children definitely by name before the Most High. And if there be a mercy in your household that you crave, don't go in a roundabout way, but be simple and direct in your pleadings with God. When you pray to Him, tell Him what you want. If you have not money enough, if you are in poverty, if you are in straits, state the case. Use no mock modesty with God. Come at once to the point. Speak honestly with Him. He needs no beautiful phraseology such as men will constantly use when they don't like to say right out what they mean. If you want either a temporal or spiritual mercy, say so. Don't ransack the Bible to find out words in which to express it. Express your wants in the words which naturally suggest themselves to you. They will be the best words, depend upon it. Abraham's words were best for Abraham, and yours will be the best for you. You need not study all the texts in Scripture to pray just as Jacob and Elias did using their expressions. If you do, you will not imitate them, or you may imitate them literally and servilely. But you lack the soul that suggested and animated their words. Pray in your own words. Speak plainly to God. Ask at once for what you want. Name persons. Name things. And make a straight aim at the object of your supplications. And I am sure you will soon find that the weariness and dullness of which you often complain in your intercessions will no more fall upon you, or at least not so habitually as it has heretofore done. But, says one, I do not feel that I have any special objects for which to pray. Ah, my dear brother, I know not who you are or where you live to be without special objects for prayer, for I find that every day brings either its need or its trouble, and that I have every day something to tell to my God. But if we had not a trouble, my dear brethren, if we had attained to such a height in grace that we had nothing to ask for, do we love Christ so much that we have no need to pray that we may love Him more? Have we so much faith that we have ceased to cry, Lord, increase it? You will always, I'm sure, by a little self-examination, soon discover that there is some legitimate object for which you may knock at mercy's door and cry, Give me, Lord, the desire of my heart. And if you have not any desire, you have but to ask the first tried Christian that you meet, and he will tell you of one. Oh, he will reply to you, If you have nothing to ask for yourself, pray for me. Ask that a sick wife may be recovered. Pray that the Lord would lift up the light of his countenance upon a desponding heart. Ask that the Lord would send help to some minister who has been laboring in vain, and spending his strength for naught. When you have done for yourself, plead for others. And if you cannot meet with one who can suggest a theme, look on this huge Sodom, this city like another Gomorrah lying before you. Carry it constantly in your prayers before God, and cry, O oh, that London may live before thee, that its sin may be stayed, that its righteousness may be exalted that the God of the earth may get unto himself much people out of this city. Equally necessary is it with a definite object for prayer that there should be an earnest desire for its attainment. Cold prayers, as an old divine, asks for a denial. When we ask the Lord coolly and not fervently, we do, as it were, stop his hand and restrain him from giving us the very blessing we pretend that we are seeking. When you have an object in your eye, your soul must become so possessed with the value of that object, with your own excessive need for it, with the danger which you will be in unless that object should be granted, that you will be compelled to plead for it as a man pleadeth for his life. There was a beautiful illustration of true prayer addressed to man in the conduct of two noble ladies whose husbands were condemned to die and were about to be executed when they came before King George and supplicated for their pardon. 
the king rudely and cruelly repulsed them. George the first, uh, it was very like his nature. And when they pleaded yet again and again and again, they could not be gotten to rise from their knees. They had actually to be dragged out of court, for they would not retire until the king had smiled upon them and told them that their husband should live. Alas, they failed. But they were noble women for their perseverance in thus pleading for their husbands' lives. That is the way for us to pray to God. We must have such a desire for the thing we want that we will not rise until we have it, but in submission to His divine will nevertheless. Feeling that the thing we ask for cannot be wrong, and that He Himself hath promised it, we have resolved it must be given. And if not given, we will plead the promise again and again till heaven's gates shall shake before our plea shall cease. No wonder that God has not blessed us much of late, because we are not fervent in prayer as we should be. Oh, those cold-hearted prayers that die upon the lips, those frozen supplications, they do not move men's hearts. How should they move God's heart? They do not come from our own souls. They do not well up from the deep secret springs of our inmost heart. And therefore they cannot rise up to him who only hears the cry of the soul, before whom hypocrisy can weave no veil, or formality practice any disguise. We must be earnest, otherwise we have no right to hope that the Lord will hear our prayer. And surely, my brethren, it were enough to restrain all lightness and constrain an unceasing earnestness, did we apprehend the greatness of of the being before whom we plead. Shall I come into thy presence, O my God, and mock thee with cold-hearted words? Do the angels veil their faces before thee, and shall I be content to prattle through a form with no soul and no heart? Ah, my brethren, we little know how many of our prayers are an abomination unto the Lord. It would be an abomination to you and to me to hear men ask us in the streets, as if they did not want what they asked for. But have we not done the same to God? Has not that which is heaven's greatest boon to man become to us a dry, dead duty? It was said of John Bradford that he had a peculiar art in prayer, and when asked for his secret, he said, When I know what I want, I always stop on that prayer until I feel that I have pleaded it with God and until God and I have had dealings with each other upon it, I never go on to another petition till I have gone through the first. Alas, for some men who begin, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and before they have realized the adoring thought, hallowed be thy name, they have begun to repeat the next words, Thy kingdom come. Then perhaps something strikes their mind. Do I really wish his kingdom to come? If it were to come now, where should I be? And while they are thinking of that, their voice is going on with, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So they jumble up their prayers and run the sentences together. Oh, stop it each one till you have really prayed it. Do not try to put two arrows on the string at once. They will both miss. He that would load his gun with two charges cannot expect to be successful. Discharge one shot first, and then load again. Plead once with God and prevail, and then plead again. Get the first mercy, and then go again for the second. Do not be satisfied with running the colors of your prayers into one another, till there is no picture to look at but just a huge daub, a smear of colors badly laid on. Look at the Lord's Prayer itself. What clear, sharp outlines there are in it! There are certain definite mercies, and they do not run into one another. There it stands, and as you look at the whole, it is a magnificent picture, not confusion, but beautiful order. Be it so with your prayers. Stay on one till you have prevailed with that, and then go on to the next. With definite objects and with fervent desires mixed together, there is the dawning of hope that you shall prevail with God.